Hi, my name is David Batsoffen and I host a travel blog called Travel and Things. And currently I'm doing a series of In Conversation With. And my guest this afternoon is Roger De La Harp. Roger, welcome. How are you doing? Thank you, Dave. All good. And you? All well, thank you. Where does lockdown find you currently? It finds us in, or you find us in George, in, on the garden route. Uh, we've moved down here a couple of years back and loving it. Are you able to see the sea from, from your window, so to speak? No, but we can see the Ochenikwa Mountains, which is um, just as good, really. Um, and the, the sea is just a few kilometers away. Um, in fact, on our, on our mountain bike rides, on our e-bike rides... Mm -hmm. There you we, go, EBT. Uh, EBT, e-bike touring. We ride up into the mountains, and um, that's about five kilometers from home, and there's the sea in the distance. It's gorgeous. How, now that you've flashed your T-shirt, tell me what an e-bike actually is. Ah, you know, I've been mountain biking for 25 years. And Pat, I've never been able to get Pat to come mountain biking with me. She really, really didn't want it. And so some friends of ours had e-bikes and we put Pat onto what they call an e-bike. Can I, can I stop you there for a moment? Because I know yes. who Pat is. People who are watching this don't know who Pat is. So my wife. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and some friends of ours had these, they call them pedal X or pedal assist or e-bikes. And they're mm. mountain bikes with a small uh, electric motor in them and a battery. And okay. it helps you pedal. It's not as though you can sit there with a the throttle like a motorbike and ride around. You have to pedal. No pedal, you don't go anywhere. And we put that onto one of those things and she just loved it. Um, and then, you know, what it must be 9,000 kilometers later, we're on our second lot of e-bikes. Why did and you break the last lot? Of... Sorry? Did you break the last lot or are these just upgraded? No, they just got a bit old. And um, so we upgraded and we got ourselves a nice new set of e-bikes. Roger, can you take an existing bike and add the battery and, and the the relevant electronics to that, or is this a specific bike that is built uh, or designed specifically as an e-bike? No, certainly uh, there are kits that you can buy that you can adapt um, a, a normal conventional either a road bike or a mountain bike, and you can adapt that to, to uh, an e-bike. Some of them have the throttle so that you can just sit there and it's like an electric bicycle. But the ones we ride um, are really e-mountain bikes and they've got a motor in the hub, you know, where the pedals are. Right. Um, I need to turn that off, David, and I will. And um, they limit it to 25 kilometers an hour of pedal assist. Okay. So once you get to 25 k's an hour, the assistance stops. And that's the, that's in, you're on your own. And actually, 25 k's an hour is quite fast when you... I, I was about to say, bike. I mean, yeah. 20, 25 k's is, is, is moving it. But if you've been doing this for a quarter of a century, give or take a year or two, um, you must have seen some radical changes in the... And I know we didn't start off this conversation to talk about bikes. No, we didn't. Why, I called, why, I've, um, why I'm chatting with Roger is to talk about um, photography and African imagery specifically. But uh, this is the beauty of these chats, is we can take it in any direction, pun intended. Sure. So yeah. there must have been, there, there must have been radical changes between the bike that you started off on, which probably took four people to lift, to the modern version where you could probably lift it with just a finger. Yes, it's certainly, certainly. My first mountain bike, it was a blue and white thing which was barely more than the conventional bicycle in those days. It had knobbly tires on and metal um, pedals. Mm. And that was about it. Since then, we've gone through incredible changes in the, in the mountain biking industry um, in terms of suspension, in terms of braking and gearing and all that sort of stuff. Of course, the, the e-bikes are while you can lift a conventional mountain bike easily with one hand, it's very light. 
not so with the e-bikes because you've got quite a large battery. battery. Yeah. But they are heavier, but the, the, the assistance makes up for that. And you've got yeah. varying levels of assistance. So Pat uses more power than or more assistance than I do because I've been riding all these years. Right. And you know, we, we go out, we do uh, we, the last trip we did through the Karoo with some friends, it was just about just over 300 kilometers. Uh, and we ride with friends through the dirt roads of the Karoo. It's gorgeous. And the photography we do en route is fabulous. Well, you see, the, the segue for me was um, camera gear. The camera gear has yeah. done exactly the same. Um, the, the advent of going from uh, regular SLR cameras to digital SLR cameras, to yeah. mirrorless cameras. Um, so let's let's chat about that. When when you go out on a bike ride, what sort of equipment are you carrying with you? One little camera. And that's it. What is the, which one is that, the Sony? No, this is a little Panasonic Lumens. This is what they call the, the TZ110. Okay. Now, we usually use the big, the big uh, Panasonic GH5s. Yeah, same thing. And uh, we've got a G couple of GH5s, and we've got a G9, and those we use for our um, proper stuff, shall we say, <laughs> when we shoot stills and video of wildlife and stuff like that. But they are a bit big and a bit expensive to drag along on a bicycle. You can, but yeah, you know, but I don't you want to have a crash with one of those. But you also don't want to. Now, what lens does that have on it? What's the zoom on that? Hmm. It's about the equivalent of a 24 to 200 mil. Okay, well, that's pretty, pretty good for what you're shooting. It, it does. It's a 20 megapixel camera. Mm -hmm. And it shoots beautiful full HD video. In fact, it might even shoot 4K. I don't know. We don't use these terribly much for video. But the quality of the video is absolutely spectacular. And we're doing more and more video these days, um, both from stock wildlife photography and from our, our lodge work, our promotional mm. videos and all that. Because I think that's that's where it tends to be moving. I'm, I've always been a stills photographer. This whole Zoom thing is is a new platform for me, and it's a, a whole new ball game. Um, and I must say, I'm enjoying it. But bush photography for me is still is still stills. Uh, oh, and I don't want being not being one person and not two. I don't want to be chopping and changing between video and stills because you lose on one that you, what you gain on another type of thing. Uh, but where I was going was I was going to ask you: you can't really carry a body with a 400 uh, f 2.8 strapped to your back while you're hurtling down a mountainside, can you? Let me think about that. No. no <laughs> <laughs> well, I've always said that's that's the holy grail for me. The holy grail or the, the unicorn of uh, camera gear is that F2.8 400. When I grow up one day, I want one of those. You want one of those? Dave, you know, um, some, some years ago, probably three, four years now, we started moving, both of us started moving from, you know, Pat was always shooting the video and I started to move into, into video as well. Um, and that came to... You know, we really started getting going in video about three years ago. And right. I was chatting to a mate of mine, and he suggested that I try the little um, Panasonic Lumix GH4. And we bought one. And the, the video, the 4K video quality on it was absolutely spectacular. And we used it more and more and more. But then they brought out the update to that, the GH5, which is now micro four thirds system. It's not a, it's not even a, a, a crop sensor format. It's smaller than that. And when they brought out the GH5s, it changed everything for us um, because we could use them for stalls as well. The, the GH4 was a 16 megapixel camera, which was a little bit small for what we were doing, but the, the GH5 is now 20 megapixels and, and, and that suits what we're doing. Yeah. And what, but what it does mean is that you can effectively double the focal length of the lenses because of the small sensor. It's like, it, let's say I put a hundred mil lens onto my Panasonic Micro Four Thirds camera. It would be the same as running a 200 mil lens 
Uh, okay. So, I mean, I can go and get it. Our, our 100 to 400 millimeter zooms that we use on our cameras equate to a 200 to 800 millimeter lens on a full frame camera. I mean, that very useful. On a, and specifically on a full frame, but can, how, take us back through your history as a photographer. Where did you start? Do you remember your first camera? Do you in fact have your first camera still? I had my first proper camera. When in standard five, uh, you, know, you remember when that was? Uh, yes. Because we're about, we're about <laughs> the same age, I think, sort of early 50s. Aren't yes. No, late yeah. 50s for me. Standard five, well, standard, really standard five for me, in fact, was, was mid 60s. It was 19, I was in standard five in 1965. Yeah. Yes, me too. Okay. But I like to think that makes us at mid 50s. Do yeah. <laughs> one, do one. Fair enough. But we went on a school trip, a standard five school trip to the Kruger National Park, and my mom lent me her Instagram camera. Okay. You remember the little Instagrams? Wait a and minute. Said, he <laughs> says, fill, fill the space with chat. Just keep talking. So off we went to, to Kruger Park and this little camera to me was, was magic. It was quite the most wonderful thing I'd ever got my hand. That, that's the very camera. My first. Uh, and Your first. And yep. I blew the whole roll of film. We only have one roll of film. I do all of that. <laughs> in one the first day. <laughs> so, <laughs> but it started a love with, with photography. And then through school, I, you know, of course, had my own darkroom and, and that sort of thing. And um, I saved up enough pocket money and I bought myself a, was an exacto. And I can't remember the, the model. But anyway, it was an exacto. And it was a a single lens reflex camera, but without the prism. So okay. it was, you had to look down. Oh, into. right. I remember those. Yeah. yeah. And I used that for a while. Um, interestingly, I bought it secondhand at the local pawn shop. And that's spelled P-O-W-N, of course. Yeah. <laughs> and and um, then I had to buy a film for it, which cost more than the camera. Um, but I used that for a while. And then... A doctor friend of my father's took pity on me and he gave us, gave me his proper single lens reflex camera. And, and again, I, I can't remember, but I used that a while and then went out and bought the Pentax K1000. That was a huge investment of 229 Rand. This was That's my same. first, no, this is the Spotmatic F. Spotmatic, this is, All right. Yeah, this is my first proper camera. Bought for my twenty first. Yeah, I was. I must have been a little younger than that. Because Maybe I had to. 19. I had to twist my parents' arm. They didn't want me to have a proper camera. I don't don't ask me why, but they just did, they didn't think it was uh, money well spent. So what I did was I yeah. went out and I bought a flash, and I bought a, I think it was a one two five. F8125 lens or something like that. Lens I still have, the flash I don't. Yes. And then the deal was, well, I've got the flash and the lens, so all you've got to do is give me the camera in between. <laughs> right. And, and I went down to the camera shop because I'd put it, all, I'd put it sort of ready to buy type of thing. And I said yes. to the, the, the guy that work, was working, there was Burmeisters in Port Elizabeth. I don't think the company oh, even no. exists anymore. And I said to them, look, I've got my 21st party coming up this weekend. Please can't I have the camera? My parents are good for it. You know who I am. They, they will, the money will come in, you know, after my party. Unbeknown to me, my dad had phoned the camera shop and said, listen, my son's on his way. If he asks to take the camera, give it to him. No. I'll come in and sort the money out. No. Without test, with so don't just sort of play along and go. Mm, oh well, we're not sure. So this yes. shot my twenty-first birthday, and I recently had it serviced, and it still works. I'm it's sure really it weird though, not having, and I'm sure not having a screen on the back. So you take the yes. picture and you go, where's the image? Oh, it's inside. <laughs> 
and you know that the, the micro four thirds cameras are the Panasonic's are well, and many of them are are they they mirrors they mirrors yes. cameras. Yeah. So you use that screen on the back wonderfully. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> You know, I went. I can't remember where we were. We were doing something with some workshop, or we were showing people how to use a camera, or whatever it was. And somebody was using a, a conventional DSLR, um, and he said, "Won't you please help me do?" I couldn't use the thing <laughs> <laughs> because I'm so used to using that that back screen these days that to well, not be able to look through it is yeah, 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 yeah. I mean. I, in 1995, I went to America to go to a country music festival. And I was yes. lucky because I had media accreditation. I was allowed into the photographic pit. And if you've ever done uh, one of those events, you're right at the stage, surrounded by yes. photographers, most of whom are sponsored by the major record labels in this particular case, yeah. or newspapers. And there's Kippy the Chicken from South Africa, who's funding his own trip. They're shooting. You can hear the motor drives. Sort of yes. brrr, Smoke. next to you, okay. and I'm sort of going, click. That's it for this artist. I don't have enough film. Yes. Come back and the 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 DNP, the development uh, of those images, cost me almost as much as my trip did. You come back with uh -uh. 36 rolls of film. You you've sort of got to go and stand on a street corner with a with a cup and say, I need money to develop my pictures. Yes, to process to process to process. Yes. Yeah. That was a fortune. Yeah. But anyway, though, so we then, I got the K1000. Right. Yes, the K1000. Yeah. And then it, it was for a hobby for many, many years, photography. And then let's see if I can get these dates right. It was in 1983-ish. I joined the Tel Parks board as a, as a ranger. Right. Um, and spent a short time in the field and then went through to head office into the planning section where we did planning for the results and stuff like that. And I started to do a bit of photography for them. And then one day, George Hughes, who was the director of Natal Parks at the time, he said to me, look, we need a, some guy to do our photography and, and that sort of stuff for us. Are you interested? So I said, well, I'll need to think about that. Yes, please. <laughs> didn't take you very long. <laughs> no, no, I didn't. And that started a career in photography. And that was, um, let me see, it was uh, the late 80s. Okay. About, thereabouts. And then from there, we, I used stores, a variety of cameras. Um, I was at the time using Canons. Um, the Natal Parks board had Nikons, had a Hasselblad, Linhart, big, large format cameras, you know, the 4 by 5 Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we progressed through the whole thing. Autofocus came on board. And at the time, the Canon autofocusing system was just so far ahead of Nikon's um, that I moved the whole Nikon system across to Canon. And I used Canon for many, many years um, with that very good autofocusing system of theirs. Yeah, they, they do. And of course, all film cameras. Yes. And then as digital started coming on, as the first proper professional di digital cameras came on, it was the the Canon 1DX. Mm. Uh, it was 11 megapixels, will you believe it? And we <laughs> shot the first digital wildlife, or, or the first wildlife book shot entirely on a digital camera. We shot that in South Africa. It was the first one. Really? It's called really? Two Black <laughs> um, I mean, I, 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 only, I changed in 2006. I, went for, um, I moved from film to, to digital. Yeah. Uh, on a Kilimanjaro climb, I had cameras, camera sponsors that wanted pictures. So I ended okay. up having to take, they were two different brands. Um, so I ended up having to carry, I had to rig a harness to carry two cameras and lenses. Oh so I could take yeah. pictures of each camera with the other one. I had to explain that, you know, the Samsung will have pictures taken oh. on a Panasonic and the Panasonic on a Samsung because I don't want to yes. carry four cameras so I can shoot your camera with your camera. With your camera. <laughs> it got a bit ridiculous. I wonder what they did in the, in the marketing, you know, photo, photo by. Yeah, Samsung, photographed by Panasonic. 
Oh, that's right. <laughs> Has, has your first love always been then wildlife, um, Roger? Yes, you know, and maybe it stems from that, that, that school trip to Kruger all those years ago. But I've always loved the outdoors, always loved bush, I've always loved travel and, you know, that sort of thing. And then I would meet a girl who had the same sort of passions for it as I <laughs> You know, travel has become our life, travel and wildlife. And well, at the moment, you, you and Pat are in a similar position to me. You are non-traveling travel writers and yes. photographers for that matter. Yes. And it's not very easy to do travel and wildlife photography sitting in your office. No, it isn't indeed. Depends on where your office is. If your office is in a game reserve and the animals tend that to wander office. through, then it's a whole different case. Yes. I was so hoping I would get... I would get stuck at a reserve that I couldn't get home for lockdown. Yes, I mean, my wife wouldn't have been very happy, but can you imagine being stuck in some five-star lodge and they go, oh, right. sorry, you can't go home. You've got to stay here. How long? I have no yeah. idea. <laughs> the, the wildlife images. Don't worry I have, about it. Yeah, don't worry. The wildlife <laughs> images though, uh, Roger, that I'm seeing from some of the reserves is spectacular because the wildlife, are not having to dodge vehicles. They're not having to dodge people. They're wandering in and out of lodges. Leopards are sleeping on verandas. Um, he, the next thing you know, they're going to be pangolins in dining rooms. For you know, I saw a picture of a leopard peeping into the windows of a of a lodge room. I can't remember what lodge it was, but there's the leopard sort of up on the windowsill. <laughs> One of our favourite lodges is in Bali. A tomcat. Tomcat. <laughs> a peeping tomcat. <laughs> Yes. One, one of our favorite lodges is in Bali, in, Sa in Sabi Sands. And they have, right. an issue, they have an issue with leopards because the leopards like to sleep on the verandas. And people get up in the early morning for like game drives, open the door, and there's a leopard lying on the chairs. Uh, we've had it, and I've got photographs to prove it. Uh, the leopard walking through the bar area, past the swimming pool, down to the height, and past that to the water hole. We've got some wonderful yeah. images. Not something you want you know, to meet on a dark night, though. No, no. But they say, you know, leopards and, and wild dogs and hyenas are the sort of animals that can live very close to communities. Um, mm. And many of the time we've been walking at a lodge back to, to our room at night, or in fact, even at Cape Vidal. You, you know Cape Vidal up in, yeah. in Quasitel? Yes, I yeah. I stepped out of the chalet one morning and they're sitting under the tree just sitting there is the leopard right there in camp. And I, you know, I walked out, it looked at me and we looked at each other. So I thought, well, first of all, don't run. So I just stood there watching it and um, it must have, I suppose, a minute we watched each other and it just got off and got up and slaughtered off. There was no stress or anything like that. Yeah, but right in camp. Roger, from a, from a, you mentioned a book that you published earlier. Your last book, um, that I know was a huge tome, and I remember talking to yes. you about it. Um, you had how many thousands of thousands of images did you go through in order to end up with what 120 in the book? Was it 70 odd thousand, if I remember correctly? Oh, it was a lot. It was. It was. I can't remember the number. Huh? But Dave, it was a lot of images. Um, you know, we did we did 22 destinations in Africa in one year. Right. I would hate to have shot that on film. Um, <laughs> yeah, hours, hours in the dark room, Roger. Hours. Hours, days went by. Days. I bet we shot an awful lot of material. It really was huge. Is that what was that book called again? It was um, African Icons. Oh, that's right. Is that still available on on? No, no. It was a very limited print run. Right. Uh, leather bound. It was dedicated. You, you couldn't buy them in the in the shops. You you had to buy it from us so that we could personalize everyone. No, that's that's done. Um, uh, we've still got a, a, a copy or two, but they don't have the um, the, the tipping page uh, where you can personalize it, and and um, they exceed the the limited number of in the run. So you know you don't want to if if you said the, the run is limited to a thousand books. You, you, you don't want to sell more than that. 
No, but also you don't want the people that you promised they, that they've got one of 1,000 and now all of a sudden you printed another two and a half thousand and their book is, is yeah, valueless. Yeah, no, you can't it, do that. You know, people don't realize, specifically for somebody like yourself and Pat, where you that's your job, is wildlife and lodge yeah. photography. And yeah. people don't realize, they think, oh, you're off to another lodge. Wonderful, you don't have to do anything. You're just gonna get taken ah. on game drives and you may yes. go out for a walk or two. You can rest the rest of the day. No, take us through a typical no. day that you go through if, you, if you're at a lodge and you're there on a commission. All right, so let's talk about that, that African Icons book. As I said, we did, it, it was, there were, we selected 21 icons. Now, it wasn't so much icons as destinations, if you like, because on some of the destinations, we had more than one icon. So an icon right. would be a lion, the lions or the elephants, or Table Mountain was an icon, Victoria Falls. So we visited 22 places in a year to shoot all those, those icons. Now, right. we spent sort of 10 days on average at each of those destinations. So first of all, you just do the sums and work out how many days we were away on, on, right. on that one. And then you've got to get home and you still need to, to sort through those images, recharge batteries, both the camera batteries and your own Etc. 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 So what the way it worked is we would fly in from Johannesburg usually if we were leaving South Africa, and let's say we were going to Ethiopia. So we fly in on a red eye flight because the deal was is that to feature in the lodge, sorry, to feature in the book, each destination would need to get us to the destination okay. and host us. So they wouldn't fly us in there on their premium business class flights. <laughs> the back of the plane. Two o'clock in the morning at the back of the plane. Yeah. In the morning. <laughs> so we fly, we were living in Howick at the time. So we'd fly Maritzburg to Joburg International or Aurora Tampa. And then fly Ethiopian Airlines, Rwanda Air, whatever it was, into the, the destination. We'd be collected at the airport and then either do a road transfer or a flight into the reserve. Now, a road transfer from, um, from Arusha, from Kilimanjaro International to into the Serengeti can take you all day. Yeah. So there is a day one. Um, and you've done red eye. I don't sleep on airplanes. I just can't. And now you do the transfer, shooting on the way, and you get to camp, check in, and you're on your first game drive. Yep. And you're shooting, 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 shooting. And into bed because you're getting back quite late. Dinner, whatever dinner may be in some of these remote areas. And then you add again an hour before sunrise the next morning. And that's the way it continues for those 10 days that you are there. Fly back on a red eye, back to, to how I download charge batteries, see what you've got, do some vague selections, and you're off again on the next one. And also, it's so not a... We were exhausted there. At the end of it, I, we were burnt up. And I, I, should, I should imagine so. You probably never wanted to see a camera again. Well, not for a short while anyway. <laughs> no. <laughs> but also, Roger, <laughs> what, during the day, you've got the lodge to shoot, you've got food to shoot, yes. all of that type of stuff. So there's very... You know, while everybody else is going, ooh, our bush holidays are so relaxing, um, those of us who work in the industry, it's, a, it's, it's long days of, of hard work because you've got to look at the lighting. Do you want this? Do you want that? What's the best time? So there's very little downtime. There's no time to lie on the bed and look at the television mindlessly. Uh, you know, here's the other thing is the stress involved because... You know, you going. We went to some fabulous places into 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 the Congo, for example, uh, into Zala in, in Congo Brazzaville. Um, and here's the thing: it costs a fortune to get there because the flights to Brazzaville are not the cheapest in the world. Then they had a charter of flight from Brazzaville for the for the three of us. There were three of us working on it into into Zala, which is a about a four-hour flight 
in a Cessna caravan. So that's expensive. <laughs> and then you're staying in a lodge, which costs a fortune. I mean, they yeah. are frighteningly expensive. So you, you go and shoot this stuff, and something's gone wrong. And you get home, and you've lost the drives, or, you know, they're not going to invite you back. No. Not at all, because that, that was going to lead me to, to my next question, which was, have you ever done anything like that? When you've arrived at your destination, you open your camera bag and you go, oh hell, I've left X at home. Whatever the X I'm gonna, was. I'm not going to tell you that. No, have, no look, we, we've screwed things up. That happens. Um, but I've never, I've, let me think. I've never not been able to produce the images at the end of it. Okay. We've, had, we've had problems, we've had technical issues, we've had stupidity issues, but we've always managed to deliver. Yeah, there's and no, oops, we, we, we missed the... Touch We've missed that, that spectacular sunrise. So can you please bring us back um, all the way so we can do the one sunrise image that we missed? Yes. Yeah. I mean, I... And here's a little tip. Yeah. This is a little tip that I learned, I learned early, early on when we were doing this professionally, is that if you get to the game reserve, wherever you are, if you see something gorgeous, shoot it. Shoot it. Don't ever think that we can come back tomorrow and shoot it. Yeah. Because it's not going to be there. It's the never going to be there. And no. even if you so think, it's, uh, it's, even impalas, I, I always say to people, mm -hmm. impala, you, you get, you go, who are the first time you see them, and then you never look at them again, but they are achingly oh. beautiful. And in the light, right, oh. in the right light, they are spectacular. Specifically, the yeah. light on the ram's horns can be oh, beautiful. Their eyes. Yeah. The eyes are beautiful. There's, there's, so, yeah, almost, yeah. there's almost nothing that you can't photograph because I should no. imagine that I don't want, uh, less is not more. More is in fact less because you can always discard images that you think, mm, well, I don't really want, I don't really need, it doesn't fit the narrative. But if you don't have that and your narrative all of a sudden finds itself going in that direction, and you go, no, I don't have an Impala picture. Yes, I can steal from somewhere else. Maybe they won't recognize the background is, is low felt instead of Karoo. But you'll know yeah. in your heart of hearts that that Wrong. image was not taken at that camp. Yeah. Specifically yes. when it comes to cats. Uh, yes. I was, because you can identify lions, leopards, they are very easily identifiable. Yep. Specifically the by the people on the lodges. So if you use a line from Medikwe in, in an article on Sabi Sands, those, both, both uh, reserves are going to go, hang on a second, those, those are A, not ours, or B, they're ours. And why did you yeah. use them for the other lot? And you've used our, the picture of our leopard, our leopard, yeah. to advertise some other guy's lodge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. they, they, mm -hmm. get, they get very possessive of their wildlife, and rightly so, because they're looking after it, and there's that, that all of that that goes that goes with it. Absolutely. But I, I, I was watching a, a YouTube talk the other day. I do a lot of um, watching of photography and wildlife and those. Uh, that's your excuse, on. Roger. No, it's a, it's it's a it's a learning process. Yeah. <laughs> and this guy was talking about. In the American chap, he, they went to um, what's it, the Grand Canyon mm -hmm. to do some to do some pictures, and of course it was an early early morning shoot. And the guys got there with his crew of people that were on his workshop, and they did some pictures. And the guy said, "Okay, right next, let's go to the next one." And he said, "No, no, we haven't finished yet." And they said, "Well, we have. You now we got the picture there." Somehow, and he said, no, we're not going anywhere. This is the shoot for the morning, so let's shoot. And at the end of the session, very much like our workshops, Dave, that we ran up at Medikwe and that sort of stuff, we go out and shoot, we take, get those pictures back. 
and then we analyze them and see where we've mm. gone right and we've got more that sort of thing. And interestingly enough, one of the pictures shot in the first hour at the Grand Canyon shoot appeared in his evaluation sessions. Right. They were all pictures shot after they'd been made in hour. Now there's something to think about. Yeah. You see this this You've is got to keep shooting. Your first pictures just get you going. Just well, this, this is it. Um, I, I always used to shoot before the vehicle stopped. And those pictures are invariably bumpy. And you sort of, I've had to force myself to go, listen, if we're coming up to lines, five seconds is not going to make a difference to whether they're still there or not. Because lines are exactly that. They will just lie, be lying around and they will wait for you. But your, your early, those images, as you bump towards them, you're not going to use anyway. So why don't you just enjoy the sighting and then you can yes. get behind the viewfinder because I don't know about you, Roger, but I've found not recently, but I've sort of become conscious of not shooting constantly at a sighting. If there are a group of lions lying oh. around, you go in, you take some pictures and then just sit and enjoy it. And then you can pick up the camera again if they've moved and take some more. But yes. take time to enjoy the moment rather than just be locked down behind a viewfinder. Yeah. You, you're so right. Um, you've, you know, I think uh, maybe it's an age thing, maybe it's an experience thing, but you know, we used to be very intent on, on utilizing every moment to shoot every aspect of everything. And it's a bit of a shotgun approach. Um, and the way we're approaching it now is, is a more measured approach. Let's yeah. call it that way. So you go in, and you get the money shot. You've got to get, especially if, if somebody's paying you to be there, you've got to bring something back. You've got to bring something really nice yeah. back. Otherwise, they start to say, you know, why are we... Why do we waste our money on you? Quite. But once you've got those money shots, the, the ones that the client is going to be happy with, then we kind of sit back and say, all right, now what? How do we how do we go to the next level from here? Yeah. And sometimes that takes a little bit of what a while of sitting there watching what's happening, watching what's going down, and then the ideas start to come in. And why don't we whatever it is? And that's where sometimes you, you get absolute rubbish because you're pushing the limits now of the situation, pushing the limits of the photography types of your skills, of your ideas, or whatever it is. But sometimes those crazy things that you try actually make for some very yeah. interesting images. But they don't come in the first minute. No. They come after you've been there an hour. I, I remember sitting with a, a lioness. Um, I was teaching a, a blogging course at a particular reserve. And we went out for a morning drive. And everybody was focused on the lioness. And they were all taking pictures. And I was looking around and I found a dragonfly on a stalk yes. within spitting distance of the vehicle. So I took some images of that. And in, in my morning lecture, I, I used that particular image. And everybody who was on the vehicle said, where did you get that? I said, I ah. took it this morning while you were busy watching the lioness. None of you looked down. And yes, I've got the picture of the lioness. I still use it from time to time because she's the biggest female I've ever seen. But nobody else got the dragonfly because they, did, they didn't, not quite think out of the box, but just look around, use your bush skills. Look around. That, look around. That's what you've been taught as a field guide is to look around. You don't focus in on the footprint in front of you. Focus to where the, 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 the animal that made the footprint might be hiding. You know, many years ago, Pat and I were in Amphilosi Game Reserve. Um, I was still working for Natal Foxwood, and we'd been driving along early, late afternoon, early evening, and there were some white rhinos in the felt on the right-hand side of the car. And we stopped, and we were both looking out the right-hand side of the car. I, mean, I was photographing the, the, these white rhinos, and we were shooting away, shooting away, shooting away, and, and you know, they wandered off. And I said to Pat, okay, saying, that's it, let's go. And right at the car, looking in the window, was a black rhino. <laughs> <That's> very inquisitive. 
this thing wandered right over to the car. It couldn't do more than five meters away in that sort of biotic stare of theirs. Yeah. To figure out what and you hadn't even noticed it. And a clue it was there. You know, we had a similar uh, thing at Kruger years ago. Um, we stopped to have a look. I think it was at a battler and very focused on the battler, taking pictures. And as we were about to drive off, I said to my mate who was with us, I said, look to your left. There was a cheetah sitting <laughs> on an anthill. It couldn't, yes. it, it, short of having a sign going, photograph me now, it yeah. couldn't have been more obvious. But yet we've been so focused on the bird that we hadn't seen it. Yeah. And it's those, uh, small, those small bush moments that happen very easily. And they're sometimes yes. over in a flash. Yeah, you know, and you know, it, it needn't necessarily be a, a dragonfly that creeps up on you. Um, we've been walking in the bush, and you'll hear a tree break and turn around, there's a whole herd of elephants behind you. And I'm not <laughs> kidding, that's actually happened to me. No, um, I'd, I don't know if I'd want to walk into a, into a breathing herd of elephants. I'm happy with my dragonfly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> is, there, is there still an animal out there that has eluded? And I'm going to stick to, to South Africa rather than Southern Africa. That has eluded your lens. And that is your, in inverted commas, unicorn. You know, I'd really love to get some, some lovely shots of, of Artbox. I've okay. got some pictures of Artbox, but not so nice. Pangolin. Again, we've got a picture or two of a pangolin, but not, not, yeah. not what I'd like to have. So oh, I was, wolf. Artwolf, I got all excited in Pilansburg when I was up there recently. I thought what I was photographing was an artwolf. And, and I, was, I was all by myself and I'm like, yes, I've never seen one of these before. Yes. And, then I, and then I looked at the photograph a little more care, care, carefully once I'd gotten back to the lodge and I went, brown hyena, David. Field guide oh, yeah. 101. You <laughs> meant to know the difference between an artwolf and <laughs> brown hyena. But you yeah. took you talk pangolin. Um, I waited 53 years to see my first. And it happened in November last year at Klaseri Sands. And we heard the call on the radio. And I'm sure you've been in similar situations. You'll hear the crackle yeah. of the radio. I thought that the voice had said penguin. And I thought, that's well, fantastic. That's if, if I can find a penguin in, in Klaseri Sands, I'm, National Geographic is going to buy the image off me. And it was a pangolin. It was a pangolin. And I said, how far? Because I've, I've been in vehicles where they've said pangolin. How far? No, it's an hour and a half away type of thing. It's not mm -hmm. worth chasing. So uh -huh. the, the ranger said to me, look, it's, it's not close, but I think it'll stay. So we rocketed off there. And I spent, they left me there with a, with a tracker. And I spent 90 minutes with the animal. I mean, it was oh, November right. last year, Pat, uh, Roger, and I still, I still have to pinch myself that after 53 years of waiting, I've, not only did I get to see a glimpse, I got to spend time with it. Two nights later, my wife goes out on a drive without me because I was working or it was drizzling or something, and shooting in a drizzle with a 560 <laughs> lens is not fun. Not they fun come fun. back and I, was say, I, I said to them, hopefully, what did you see? And my wife says, you're not going to believe this. I go, oh boy, you didn't go. see a pangolin, did you? And she said, yes. So had I gone with them, my first pangolin would have taken 53 years and my second would have taken 24 hours. <laughs> but I had, the I had the better sighting. So, so that's my unicorn. Artfark as well. Uh, I've been to Samara. And they've always promised me Artfark in the Karoo. Yeah. They, they, they leave the day before I get there and they return the day after I've left. I know where to find them. Oh, no. So do I, but they're okay. never there. But the cost of staying there is just... Where are you just talking? Tinsualu or one of those? Tinsualu. Yeah, Tinsualu, yeah. Pe people always say to me, these lodges, how do they justify the price that they charge? And I go, because... Overseas people are prepared to pay that sort of price. It's as simple as that. It's supply yeah. and demand. Although and the, at the moment we're all in the same boat, nobody's going anywhere. Nobody's going anywhere. But 
yes, and you know, that people are prepared to pay those prices, but also if you look at the cost of of operation, it can get very, very costly to run yeah. those lodges. And you know, it's you know, it's not a little bed and breakfast in some little Kurudorpi. This is, you know, and again, if you look at Salu, um, that's a hundred thousand hectares of of land, you know, that's I was going to say, Tualu is a hundred thousand is a hundred thousand hectares of prime pangolin territory. That's very close. <laughs> <laughs> a hundred thousand hectares is quite expensive. It is indeed. Roger, do you do you guys have plans for once lockdown is over? Have have you got um, places already booked or clients who have said to you, look, as soon as this is over, we want you back? No, funny enough, I was just talking to some clients yesterday. The problem is those clients would have been without any revenue coming in for already, what, three months? Three months, yeah. And there's no travel. And so they were saying they cannot see that they'll be open any, anywhere before January, February next year. And even then, I don't know how much traveling is going to be happening there. So, I don't think they can afford me. Not well, that we is, charge a vast fortune, but yeah, I think they've got other problems rather than photography. So we mm -hmm. now are having to look at alternatives to, you know, where's the Dillahar product? Now, yeah, it's always been stock photography. We've shot stock photography for many, many years, and that market is also a bit quiet. And then large photography has been our big one that we've, yeah. we've photographed all manner of lodges. But yeah, you've just come back from Jock, another one of my favorites. Oh, yes, Jock. It's a lovely, lovely game. Well, one I mean, of the, the, one of the early off. camps, if I remember correctly, is one of the first camps that yes. was put up in Kruger. Yeah, yeah. it's fantastic. We, we got, you want to see the leopard pictures I got there on the last trip. It's just mind blowing. Um, in Kruger National Park, it's yeah, absolutely incredible. But so, what we're having to do, Dave, is to, to try and figure out what the next product is going to be. Um, certainly, in workshops, um, we're looking at some online workshops, perhaps, which means that we can do it from anywhere, and yeah. our and our participants can be anywhere. So that's something that we we're considering. Um, we're looking at ebooks. We're looking at all manner of things that. Because if people need a, you do need a product. If people do want to find out more about you, Roger, as we wrap up our chat, how do they go about that? Well, they can either go to AfricaImagery.com, which takes you into the our uh, image bank section of Roger and Pat Delahoff Photography. Right. But the easiest way is just Roger and Pat Delahoff.com, and there we go. That's it's our website. That. And if people We've forget that. Well, they can just go to www.travelandthings.co.za and they can find this um, there. And they can also find all sorts of links uh, to um, Roger and Pat's work. So www.travelandthings.co.za. Roger, thanks so much for chatting to me. It's been, it's been fun. We haven't spoken like this for the longest time. No, and, it's been uh, wonderful. Thanks for the, the invite. I have thoroughly enjoyed it. And uh, I'm going to be talking to your wife in the not too distant future. And we're going to be talking video photography um, or videography with her. So you can prep her for what's about to, to befall her. So she's got all the, the information, all the cameras, everything ready. So we don't have to get up and, and leave frame. No problem. Roger, yeah, thanks. That's, this is really good. Huh? Thanks very much for being in conversation with this afternoon.